Hello. Welcome. An apple a day keeps the doctor away. That is a common phrase, but where does it come from? Some suggest it comes from this myth from uh, the Norse mythology. This story is called Idun and her golden apples, the apples of immortality. Uh, so a little bit of apple folklore in this story. And it also includes Loki, everyone's favourite trickster, who incidentally plays Tom Hiddleston in the Marvel franchise. You may have heard of him. Uh, all right, so here goes. <clears throat> Long ago, long, long ago, when the world was still freshly formed and newly made and humans were very, very scarce upon its surface. One um, bright wintry morning, three gods decided to go for a walk across Middle Earth. They were Odin, the Allfather, Honir, the god of uncertainty, and Loki, god of mischief. Now, these three had a lovely morning walking over the snow-covered landscape of the middle world of Midgard. And they passed through forests and over icy rivers and round the base of great conical mountains. And Odin marvelled at all the glory, all the wonder of his creation. But night was drawing in and the gods uh, were concerned that they hadn't brought any food with them. Uh, and Loki, always hungry, said, I'm hungry. And Odin said, what are we going to eat? And Honir, the uncertain, said, I don't know, because <laughs> he's always uncertain. Uh, but the gods were saved because they rounded the edge of that big conical mountain. And there, in a snow-covered plain, were an entire herd of great oxen, or uroks, huge ancestors to the domestic cow with great horns. So Loki sized one up and sort of stalked it with his tricksy ways and he separated it from the herd and chased it towards the other gods and then Odin with his spear that never misses skewered it and killed it stone dead. Now uh, Loki set to quartering it into quarters uh, so they could eat it um, while um, while Honir gathered some firewood uncertainly under Odin's supervision and then Loki who incidentally is sometimes called the god of fire kindled a great blaze with those um uh, oak boughs now that fire was roaring away really nicely and loki really good at feeding a fire loki and it was a right old blaze and then they got the four quarters of this ox and they put them right in the center of that fire and they got real, really nicely charred on the outside and oh, the smell that was coming off that burning oxen was just, it was making all three gods mouth water and they just couldn't wait to eat, to eat it. Loki especially because he was always hungry as tricksters always are, ruled by desire. <clears throat> um, uh, and then Odin mm, wetted his lips and says, mm, is it ready? And Honor said, I'm not quite sure. Is it ready? And Loki spat, you're going to choke on your uncertainty, Honir. But he knew it was ready. So he took one of the great haunches of meat off and sliced open. And inside it was pink. Worse than pink. It was, it was red. It was blue. It was raw. Completely uncooked. Put the meat back on the fire, Loki, said Odin. And Loki did so. And then he piled huge great logs, huge trunks of trees on that fire, and it was blazing and blazing and blazing. Anything in it would have been consumed to a crisp. And um, and Loki said, is it done yet? And Hone said, I'm not sure. And Odin said, take the meat off, Loki. Let's have a look and see. And they took the meat off, but still it was completely cold inside. And Odin, with his wisdom, said, something or someone is preventing this meat from cooking. Indeed they are, said a voice from up in the oak tree above them. Uh, and all three gods looked up and there sat in the branches of the oak tree. There's a great big snow covered oak tree above me right now. And I'm imagining sat in its branch was a huge eagle, massive, biggest eagle you've ever seen. And it was looking down at the three gods uh, with a sort of imper imperious expression on its face. If eagles can look imperious, eagles always look imperious, don't they? And the eagle said, I will allow that meat of yours to be cooked if you let me have my fill and you can have the remains. And 
Loki fumed at this. Ahunir, of course, was uh, uncertain, but the other two gods, Loki and Odin, they were as one mind. Loki, he was hungry and he wanted to eat, and Odin, being wise, knew there was no way for them to eat unless they let the eagle have his share, because Odin knew that this eagle was uh, some sort of wizard and was stopping that meat from being cooked. So the gods agreed, and that eagle leapt down off its perch and then took two haunches of meat with two claws and flew up to the tree and um, um, swallowed them straight down um, and then leapt down and took the other two haunches and um, swallowed one down and was just about to eat the other, the last piece of meat, when Loki shrieked, no, that's the last, and he grabbed up his staff and he struck that eagle right across the back. Something happened because that stick, it uh, stuck to the eagle's back as if by magic and then that eagle flapped its wings and took off into the sky and to Loki's um, <laughs> shock his hands were stuck fast as if by magic to the other end of that staff so Loki was carried up and away into the sky and that eagle flew and now happens uh, a sort of uh, skit that might have a place in maybe a sort of an old school Disney or sort of um, Walt Disney film. So uh, Loki was uh, dragged along the surface of, of, of the plane, banging his knees and shins on rocks. And he was sort of, uh, and that eagle flew just above, uh, just above the treetops of a great forest full of thorns and briars and all his skin was torn. And then, I don't know, he, he got his one foot stuck in a wasp's nest and they were all over him. And then another foot in a bee's nest and he was going, ah, no, the bees! And they were stinging him all over. And then, I don't know, uh, it sort of dipped him in an icy pool of water that was full of crabs and the crabs were all kind of grabbing onto him and he came out again and they were grabbing his ears and his nipples and his balls and then and then that eagle flew way up into the sky way over the freezing oceans between the realm of the frost giants and the realm of men up so high so the mountains were getting smaller and smaller and smaller below Loki and he was very very frightened and he was screaming please let me go you want me to let me go no no not now please put me down and that eagle carried Loki all the way back to his lair <clears throat> which was, uh, which was uh, a castle built into the side of a mountain in the realm of the frost giants, because that eagle was actually a giant, assuming eagle form. And he circled round his great citadel and he flew down to the sea that was uh, surrounding his castle and there was a great iceberg and he just dropped Loki on that iceberg so there was no way of him escaping. And then boom, he landed on the iceberg and turned back into his giant form and he said, Hello, Loki. And Loki looked up and said, Ah, Diazi. Because Loki knew that giant's name. Because Loki was part giant. Uh, now, just a bit of a note about giants in Norse myth. They're not, they're sometimes, you know, ugh, like huge giants. Thiazi was pretty massive. But giant, it's a sort of, it's not a great translation for us to giant. They're, they're sort of they're sort of magical beings, really. Like um, they're like jealous gods or uh, titans or just supernatural beings, demons, if you like, might be a better um uh, idea to have in your head. Uh, just very powerful beings, um, and uh, quite often very adept at magic, as was the case of Thiazi, because he knew Loki and Loki knew him. And Thiazi said, you traitor, Loki, you've grown soft at your time with the gods. Well, you're going to stay here on this iceberg getting cold unless you give me the goddess Idun and her golden apples of immortality. Well, Loki wasn't particularly pleased about this, but he saw he had no choice. And after he stayed on this iceberg for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven days, finally he gave in. And Thiazi would come out, he would row on his little boat out to the iceberg each day and ask him if, if, he, had, if he would agree yet. And finally on the seventh day, uh, uh, Loki agreed and said, I will bring you somehow, I don't know how, but I will bring you Idun and her golden apples of immortality. You swear, you swear an oath, said Thiazi. I swear, said Loki. Oaths are important things in these days. Very, very bad news to break one. So, the Azi said this. In seven days, in seven days' time, when the sun is at its zenith in the sky, you will lead Idun over the Bifrost Bridge. That's the rainbow bridge that separates the realm of the gods, the Aesir, with the realm of men. This world here. Um, you will lead Idun over that bridge in seven days' time, and I will take her. 
do this, Loki. And Loki agreed. And with that, the Azi uh, turned himself back into an eagle, picked Loki up and flew him and dumped him right at the base of the Rainbow Bridge. <clears throat> and Loki, battered and bruised as he was with his hair all bedraggled and filthy and shivering cold, he walked over the Bifrost. And who did he see first of all when entering... Uh, the Hall of the Aesir, the, the heavenly realm of the Norse gods. Well, he saw Heimdall, of course, who always keeps watch on the realm of men and always stands there solid as a pillar, just looking for any sign of trouble. And as Loki walked past his hall, he swore he saw Heimdall had a little smirk at the corner of his mouth. Mm. Words gone on ahead of me, thought Loki. And he walked, you know, into the main area of Asgard. And then he comes across Thor, who looks at him and his face splits open in a massive grin. And he laughs and points at Loki. Ha, 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 ha. Had a nice flight, Loki. You've come back, have you? Ha, 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 ha. Yeah, laugh it up, big man, says Loki. And he does. Ha, 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 ha. Stupid Loki. Ha, ha, ha. Thor always liked to have a joke at Loki's expense because normally the boot was on the other foot. And sure enough, Loki got into um, the hall, and there was Honir the Uncertain, uncertainly telling the story of how Loki had been plucked up by that eagle and bashed on the ground and got the wasps on his face and crabs on his nuts and all that, and all the other gods, there was there was Tyr and Frey and Freya and Balder, they were all <laughs> having a big old laugh at Loki's expense, and Loki inwardly fumed, but outwardly was calm as anything. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> Loki uh, just festered over this, but after a while, you know, they stopped telling the jokes eventually. And uh, five, six, seven days passed, and Loki was concocting how he was going to trick Idun out of her apples and lure her over the Bifrost. He hit upon a plan. He came running into um, Idun's orchard one time. Now, Idun, she, uh, she's a very old um, goddess. She's the goddess of um, oh, just... Just innocence and childhood and youth and beauty and, and kindness and giving. And uh, above her hall, there's a sloping orchard filled with apple trees. And these apples are golden and they bestow whoever eats them with um, eternal youth, eternal beauty, immortality. And that is why the gods do not die. It's because of Idun's golden apples. We all have a golden apple inside here. So Idun was there um, sweetly and innocently untroubled by time or suffering or the troubles of the world, just softly humming to herself, plucking these golden apples, making sure which ones were ripe and putting them in the basket that she had over her arm to give to the gods that came to her each day for their daily um, apple a day. Um, now Loki came across Idun and he came running up to her and there was, there was, there was a great panic and excitement upon his face and he said, Idun, Idun, thank goodness, I came as quickly as I could. I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't seen it with my own eyes. Idun, you will scarcely believe it too. And Idun said, speak more simply, please, Loki. She was a sweet and slightly simple thing. Apples, apples, Idun, said Loki. I have seen, I have seen a tree just at the base of the Bifrost, the Rainbow Bridge. A tree with golden apples. They are, they are, yes, they are even more wonderful than your apples, Idun. <gasps> Thought Idun, more beautiful than my apples? It cannot be. I'm sure they are, Idun. Maybe they have even more magical properties. Come, let's see. Uh, don't forget your apples. We need to compare them. And quickly, Idun, in a panic, hurried after Odin. She had to see if these stories were true about some apples, even more wonderful than hers. And she scurried behind Lo Loki over the rainbow bridge and the fire. The rainbow fire licked at the soles of their feet but did them no harm. And as they went over the bridge, separating the, the worlds, they went and stepped one foot at the forest on Midgard, at the base of the rainbow bridge. And just as Idun did the same, and she put her two little white feet on the mossy ground of the middle world, <coughs> an eagle came swooping out of the sky and plucked up Idun and took her away and left Loki on his own, going, mm. 
doesn't feel so good. But I had no choice. Now, Diazi in eagle form took Idun all the way back to his citadel, which, as I said, is growing out of a cliff face above an icy sea in the realm of giants. And he put her in a cell, and he said, uh, uh, he put her in a cell and said, I have your apples now, Idun, and you will marry me, and the gods will grow old and die, and I will live forever with you. And Idun said, mm -mm. And Thiazi said, oh, you'll get used to it. And he snatched one of the apples from a basket and ate it. <coughs> Nothing happened. He didn't feel any younger. You see, Idun has to gift the apples. That's how the magic works. Otherwise, uh, they don't work. Otherwise, they're just, they're just apples. Uh, and Thiazi, he knew something was wrong. And he said, tell me, tell me the secret. But Idun shrunk away in fear. And he said, you will tell me. And he waited for a few days, and eventually he would go out fishing with his daughter in a little boat on the, on the sea. But every day he would come back and demand it and tell her the secret of the apples. But she didn't. She just shrunk away in fear, like a child that's been yelled at. Meanwhile, in Asgard, the gods uh, did not have their daily apple. They couldn't find Idun. They couldn't find her anywhere. And of course, they couldn't just pick the apples themselves. They had to be gifted by Idun. And gradually, very quickly, the gods began to age. <laughs> so um, Sif's beautiful golden hair turned kind of silvery grey. Balder's uh, beautiful looks and his glowing skin began to get all a bit pale and translucent and wrinkly. Uh, uh, even Thor's mighty arm became a bit flabby and weak, so he could barely lift Mjolnir, his hammer, the defender of the gods. Even Odin, the wise, began to get a bit um, uh, uh, senile and would keep forgetting where he'd left his spear and was wondering why there was a bloody raven landing on his shoulder the whole time and his one eye was getting a bit misty and he would go, <gasps> and all the gods started sort of shuffling around their knees, knocking together and would say things like, in my day and I don't think you should do that and let me just tell you something they were beginning to get a, they, they were beginning to get a bit a bit soft in the head and weak of body and they were always kind of shuffling around until odin summoned the last of his remaining intellect and thought we need to do something because because all the gods were beginning to become very aware of something it's called time and its ravages because uh, that's something we all know very well that there's not so much time left. Now, Odin gathered all the gods together in his hall, and he counted them one, two, three, four, and five, three, four. Eventually he managed, and he realized there were two of the Aesir missing, Loki and Idun. Mm. Odin narrowed his eye. Has anyone seen Loki and Idun? And then Heindel the Watcher of the Gods, thought back. Yes, he said, I saw them a few days ago walking over the Bifrost Bridge. Loki was leading Idun away. Well, with that, a silence, a horrible silence descended over the gods. They knew Loki was up to no good. They searched everywhere for him, all through Asgard. No drinking hall was left unchecked, no stone was left unturned. They searched everywhere, but Loki wasn't in his hall. They searched for him, <clears throat> and eventually, eventually they found him in Adun's own orchard, lounging in the shade of an apple tree. Well, they grabbed him, and they dragged him, and Loki protested, I haven't done anything, I haven't done anything. Why aren't you old, said Thor, jabbing his finger at him. And they, they dragged Loki to the hall of Odin, and they said, tell us, what have you done? Heimdall saw you leading Idun away. It's true, it's true, but let me tell you something, said, let me tell you something, said Loki. <clears throat> I had to do it. Remember that, remember that eagle that picked me up? That was none other than the giant, the giant wizard, Thiazi. And he made me swear an oath that I had to take Idun's apples. He swore an oath, but did you have to keep it? You know better than anyone, Odin, the importance of an oath. And Odin went, mm. but you are Loki, the oath breaker. If you've been fraternizing with eagles, Loki, said Odin, then why don't we turn you into one? Give him the blood eagle. And they were ready then splaying him and ready to open his back so his ribcage sprung open like a pair of wings and Loki went no 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 I'll get it back I will get it done back I promise if Freya 
will only lend me her falcon cloak. Well, Freya didn't have much choice but to agree. Freya, you see, had a magical cloak made of falcon feathers, and whoever wore it would turn into a falcon. Loki had borrowed it many times before. Ah, uh, so Loki went with Freya to her hall, and then she got her um, falcon feather cloak from where it was kept. <clears throat> and all of Freya's beautiful hair had fallen out. <laughs> and Loki said to her, you're not so attractive now, you're bald. <laughs> Freya said nothing at this, and Loki whoop, turned into a falcon and flew out the window towards the realm of giants. And when she was gone, she just cried quietly to herself, because she had lost her beauty, what she was so famous for. So Loki flew and flew and flew from the realm of the gods, over the realm of men, all the way to the realm of the frost giants, where Thiazi's castle um, stood upon a cliff face and he flew through one of the windows and there he found in a in a cold cell next to a smoky fire was <laughs> a very smoky fire was a dun and she was sobbing and shivering in the corner <clears throat> luckily thiazi was out fishing with his daughter and loki turned from a falcon back into his true form and idun looked up and said loki and without saying a word Loki merely spoke the magic runes, and Idun turned into a little nut, a hazelnut. And then Loki grabbed the nut, turned back into a falcon, back out of the castle window. Pretty smooth move, I'm sure you'll agree. So Loki, speeding his way in falcon form back across the, the middle well, back towards the realm of the gods, when Thiazi comes back with his daughter and he notices Idun has been taken and he knows exactly what's happened. Loki has stolen her away. And uh, quick as thinking, he transformed himself back into that mighty eagle and he flew after Loki. He knew he was only going to go one way, back to the realm of the gods. The thing is, a giant eagle is a lot quicker than a regular-sized falcon, and he was gaining on Loki, gaining on Loki, holding Idun in nut form in his little falcon claw. Meanwhile, in Asgard, uh, Odin had made the other gods uh, cut down many of the trees in Asgard and build a huge uh, pyre of wood just outside the just outside the walls, um, just outside the walls of uh, of Asgard. And Heimdall, with his far-sightedness, could see Loki was on his way. He's coming, said Heimdall. Build up the pyre, put the shavings on top, said Odin. He's coming, and he's being pursued by Thiazi, and Thiazi is gaining on him. Sure enough, Thiazi was vom, vom, getting closer and closer and closer to that little falcon that was weaving and turning through the air, and then... Loki just gets to the very walls of Asgard and Thiazi behind him, spreading his huge wings, flexing his claws, ready to tear Loki from the sky. And then Loki flies, he sees all the faggots of wood, he knows instantly what uh, Odin has already planned, and God of Fire speaks the fire runes, and it all catches a blaze. And Loki just just in time nips past the fire, but Thiazi, this huge blundering eagle, he cannot stop in time and fly straight through a wall of flames that it singes all his feathers and he can't fly properly and he crashes to the ground and he turns himself back into giant form screaming ah! with fire on his arms but the gods are ready with their weapons sticks him with his spear tear with his sword stabs him and thor manages to lift up his hammer even in his aged form and brings it down on Diaz's head with a crack of lightning and his skull is splattered all over the flagstones of, um, of Asgard. And, and Loki boom, turns back into his true form and looks around at these blood-spattered, panting, old gods. <laughs> and he looks at them and he points and he laughs and he laughs and he laughs and he laughs and he laughs. And Thor tries to give him a cuff around the side of the head, but he's so old, Loki can just go step back and go, oh, careful, old man. <laughs> and the gods are grumbling now and they're starting to crowd around Loki. Let me just tell you something. <sighs> and Loki brings the nut from his pocket, drops it, boom, and Idun appears before them, innocent as she always was, 
uh, untroubled by what's happened to her. And she draws golden apples out from pockets and folds of her clothes and hands them out to the gods who become young again. Thank you. <sighs> this is an interesting story as well for me because uh, because it has um, well Loki in it in uh, in full on tricks to form, uh, and you know he, he's sort of, he's sort of done all right in this Loki. He's not he's not full on evil. He's not really good, um, but it's it's interesting Loki's associations with fire in this story because um, some people put him as a fire god. Uh, which is maybe why we don't see him represented so much in, in archaeology, because maybe he's just represented by a hearth fire. There's a lot of evidence for that. Um, but also, um, I'm reminded of Prometheus um, by Loki in the story, because of his associations with fire, but also Prometheus, of course, is um, is part titan, part giant, just like Loki. Um, and this idea of, uh, this idea of uh, stealing uh, for good, um, which is a very, very trickster idea. Um, uh, yeah, um, also interesting in this story that we've got uh, Loki sort of uh, cross-dressing, <laughs> uh, wearing women's clothes, a falcon coat, um, also something that Odin does, incidentally, um, because Odin and Loki, they, they're, they're quite similar, actually. Um, some people think that once upon a time they might have actually been the same god, uh, but that's probably something for another, another video. Um, so yeah, uh, trickster, uh, a, very, uh, a very good trickster story there. Um, what I find really interesting about this story uh, is that um, we have the idea of gods aging, <laughs> which you don't see in a lot of mythologies. And it's these apples, these apples that um, provide immortality. And in this story, you get this in a lot of trickster stories, uh, the, the, the cosmic order or sort of the, the existing, the pre-existing order, the unchanging order, is threatened by some agency, by trickster, um, uh, uh, or by the giants who 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 who, who do die. They they threaten um, the unchanging order of the gods, uh, and that's 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 sort of that's a really important trickster function because actually because you know they're so bloody smug, aren't they, the gods? And the uh, in, if if you interpret it in terms of our world, sort of elites or uh, or um, a pre-existing social order, maybe in politics, if it's the same for too long, it gets very stale. Um, it gets smug, doesn't it? And then you need some agency, some trickster agency. We've seen this a lot in the last few years in, in, in the Western world, certainly, to come and threaten that order and shake things up a bit. Uh, there's no saying you get uh, a better world after it. You might get a much worse one. But, um, but yeah, that idea, the sort of unchanging, the unchanging world represented by the gods who are, you know, just and true and the righteous rulers and all that and then tricksters and giants that that, that that you need just to keep them on their toes and that's what happens in this story um so uh we all need a bit of trickster uh this is a story about tricksters and golden apples thank you very much see you later